those of you who have been here in the past, this will hopefully sound a lot better. Um, so my name is Sky Long. I'm a graduate student at the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology Program at UMass Amherst. Go Amherst! And uh, welcome to the Science Cafe. So a couple of announcements before we get started. One, we'd like to thank Esalon Cafe for again letting us come and invade their space and bring in some wonderful cheeses. Um, and I would encourage you to please buy something from them. These guys are working uh, extra overtime, so tip generously and be nice and friendly to them. So thank you, Esalon, for letting us come in. And so, um, yeah. So the other thing is that um, for the most part today we're going to be talking about science and kind of what science is and what it does. But I do want to announce that we will be talking a little bit about genitalia. So in particular, duck genitalia. Uh, I promise it will not get saucy, but I just wanted to let everyone know that that will be happening in case there's any sensitivity. So that will be on towards, uh, kind of leaning towards the end of the talk um, if you want to kind of bail out before that happens. But I would say that you didn't because duck genitalia is actually pretty awesome. So I'm going to stick around for that and Patty will tell you more about that. So this is Patty Brennan. Um, she is a researcher at UMass Amherst and she is in my building. She's right down the hall from me. So we have spiders and, and duck penises, which is great in our hallway. We are the weirdos of UMass. Um, and so actually it's fitting that as the weirdos of UMass, uh, we are here talking about oddball science. Right? And so, uh, Patty, uh, you are going to tell us a little bit about what oddball science is and kind of give us a few examples of, I'm sure other people could think of it, but what are some good examples of oddball science? Well, so, um, first of all, thank you so much. Are, are you guys hearing Michael? this? It's also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. Now it's okay. Yeah, now it's okay. okay. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure. I've sat actually in the audience many, many times and really enjoyed it. So I hope it's fun tonight as well. Um, so oddball science, this is uh, uh, this idea that, you know, scientists sometimes study really weird things. Um, and, you know, some examples here are, you know, the, the really ugly naked mole rats that have these subterranean uh, rodents that live in large colonies and they don't have any hair and they can't see anything and they're very weird looking and people, uh, you know, seem to be really fascinated by their, their weird behavior. They look like little hot dogs on legs and, and then you have people who have studied weird things like you know why jellyfish glow and they study the the uh, gila monster um, you know and it, it produces some weird saliva that that uh, it is called a venom basically that they use for their defense and people have been studying that weird saliva in the gila monster for a while um, they study mating behavior in flies, you know, that seems kind of odd, that seems kind of strange. That is very weird. Um, you know, they study birds, uh, how they learn to sing and, and how they do that, you know, why, um, what's going on. Uh, are those little, learning. are those the headphones? They're or? actually little headphones, you know, <laughs> I know, I know, it's really cute. Uh, you know, people have studied silk, for example, and, and you know, what are the properties of silk. That seems kind of a little strange and, and, and weird. They studied predatory behavior, you know, what predators do to catch prey successfully. Um, and then, you know, migratory behavior of birds. And a lot of people would argue that these are all interesting, you know, that there are, there are things that we might be curious about and we want to understand the world a little bit better. But in the large scheme of things, it would seem like scientists are just picking out really strange things, really yeah. weird things yeah. to study. Yeah, um, very strange, Penny. That seems really weird. I have to say, I think you're going to have to convince me why I think it's other than adorable. Why I care that that little guy's wearing headphones up there because it seems pretty weird to me. So, is there some reason other than just curiosity why we might be interested in this? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, um, uh, you know, these these examples are, are obviously not picked at random, as you can imagine. These are all examples of science that is, seems kind of odd, and when we don't know where it's going, um, it's hard to imagine how they might have an impact, but. All of them have had some kind of interesting impact, and I've listed um, some of them here. Uh, this, oh, actually, I didn't show this one, but this is a gecko climbing up a, a glass, and this is, of course, uh, those of you who are in this area would have probably heard of the gek skin breakthrough. That is a is a development that came from uh, really using knowledge about how geckos can climb straight surfaces, uh, and and how can they do that and not fall down, basically defy gravity. 
to create a novel material that actually is going to allow us to, to have an, an immense amount of uh, technological applications. Everything from you know hanging your TV on the wall to clothes that you might want to wear and you know Spider-Man like uh, military feats and things like that. Um, and these are all based on on people who figure out you know just how geckos have that ability of climbing straight up walls. Um, there is also the the idea that we could study why jellyfish glow actually uh, ended up in the development of green fluorescent protein, which is uh, a molecule that we use now extensively in every kind of, of uh, uh, health application you can imagine that you can insert into uh, organisms to make certain genes glow when they are expressed. And so as a result, you can actually uh, really quite easily uh, study the action of genes, which is something that, you know, a couple of decades ago was all but impossible. So this is all because somebody was curious about how jellyfish glow. Uh, the silk, for example, that I showed earlier, uh, this is actually a paper that just literally came out. And um, I decided to show it today because this is in the last month. There is a paper that just came out about using silk to fix fractures in humans. And so the really cool thing is that these are, these are biodegradable screws that they can use. They make them out of silk, spider silk. And, and they're, they're basically, they put them in, they um, uh, never have to go back and take them out. And they are absolutely uh, wonderful and they'll decay on their own and, and they uh, speed up the healing process compared to, for example, metal screws that have all sorts of negative impacts for people. Um, some of the other pictures I show, for example, studying the mating habits of flies. That's one of my favorite stories. It actually, in a particular fly of species, I know, in a particular fly species, they actually use that knowledge to develop what is known as the sterile male technique. It's the single most important technique that we use to control pest insects um, in this country and around the world. And it was all based on knowing that uh, females um, uh, of the screwworm flies make only once in their life. Mm -hmm. And so what the researchers did is that with that knowledge, they figured that if they sterilize some males with x-ray machines and then release them back out in the wild, they would mate with the females and those females would never lay any fertile eggs. And so within a couple of generations, they were able to completely eliminate this pest uh, that was causing damage to the cattle industry to the tune of about $20 billion a year. So something that seemed really trivial, just figuring out how flies are mating, actually ended up having a huge impact to society, a huge positive economic impact. The little bird with the headphones for you, Sky. Thank you. Um, this uh, actually, these this discoveries of how birds learn how to sing led to our understanding that birds actually have uh, a plasticity in their brain cells that they can actually create new neurons, grow new neurons, and that they, uh, you know, are able to recruit them to do some specific tasks. This was something that was completely breaking the dogma that the brain, once it was there, there were never any new neurons born. And now we know, thanks to a lot of these studies of avian bed brains, we know that the, not only are the new neurons being uh, created in the human brain, uh, in the brain all the time, but in humans, and they have to do with learning, they have to do um, with uh, memory, with the special tasks, all sorts of things that we didn't know before. And this is now an entirely new field of neurobiology called neuroplasticity. And so this all started with somebody's curiosity. This was Fernando Nottebaum, who wanted to know how birds manage to learn songs you know, and why is it that they can only do it in some short periods of time during their life? Uh, the migratory behavior in birds, again, is something that seems like, okay, well, this is just somebody's theory. We now incorporated this knowledge into our uh, industry that regulates flight all around the world so that we know what kinds of altitudes do we need to avoid, when are the times of the year where birds are more likely to be flying around in groups, and how we should increase uh, uh, airspace safety. And then finally, predator-prey interactions actually have been used to increase national security. No. So this is something, yes, no. absolutely. <laughs> because what happens is that you learn, you can figure out what are the strategies that predators are using that are successful to catch prey, and what strategies prey have co-evolved
to actually prevent those predators from being successful. And those are actually very analogous to the way in which terrorist organizations, for example, can behave when they're trying to attack civilians. So there have been direct benefits in increasing our national security derived from that understanding. That's, that's incredible. And you now, I, I mean, looking at this, it's obvious that that these things have led to these amazing <coughs> events. But I, I, you know, when someone goes in and says, "Hey, I'm going to look at the mating habits of screwworm flies." Good luck with that dissertation. Um, you know, do they go in there and they say, you know, I want to do this because I want to develop this technique. When I go into predator-prey interactions, do I say, wow, I really want to look at this cheetah because I want to see how to defend national security. You know, do we know in advance when we come up with these weird ideas kind of where the end is going to be? Can we predict where that end is going to be? No. <laughs> no, we can't. And that is, is, is a bit of a problem, right? Because if you think about it, we, we have no idea where this research is going to end up going. And all of these things that I just described to you are projects that have happened over a matter of decades, right? So it takes a very long time to build these projects from that original curious observation into a direct application. And so um, here's the way that, that uh, we think about it when we think of, about science and the scientific process is that you start with these questions that are very fundamental, very basic questions about how something works yeah. and why organisms are doing one thing and not another. And then at some point, those, um, that entire base of knowledge, of this basic knowledge, can actually become some sort of application. And so here are the things that are you know, developing a new medicine that's going to help cure some disease. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and things of that nature. And then in the interface between those two is what we know as this translational science. It's like this new boom word. <laughs> you guys have probably all heard about translational science, right? So it's, it's everywhere, it's like the next big thing. And what it is, is actually sort of like this connection between basic science and applied science, where you go back and forth, and you have a problem that you want to solve, and then you ask a question very directly related to that problem, and you go back and forth between them to try to figure out how to get the application done. But the whole thing is built on this knowledge of basic science, which is not direct, not right? Direct, right? And you can't really um, very specifically get there from one point. In fact, there are lots of connections that are happening in this pyramid. So it's never a straight line. It's never something that you can predict from the beginning. But it's a real network. And there's an example that I actually love to use, which I'm going to show you guys tonight. Uh, that I think illustrate this uh, example really well. And so what it is, is actually, um, uh, this is uh, Professor Tim Brook, uh, who um, uh, actually back in, in the 60s, in the early 60s, was really fascinated by um, how, were, how photosynthetic organisms were distributed along a thermal gradient. And so what this means is, he was out in Yellowstone National Park and he was looking at these thermal vents where there wasn't supposed to be any life. Because up until that time, the upper limit of life was only thought to be about 70 degrees um, uh, uh, Celsius. And so everything that was higher than that, hotter temperatures than these, they figure there's not going to be any life. But he went there and he actually saw that there were things in the water. There, there was stuff in the water, slime mold, you know, was, was growing everywhere. And he was really curious to find out how those photosynthetic organisms were distributing themselves along those term, thermal differences in these in this thermal pools. So he was interested about doing this in the, in the 60s. Uh, so then they continued studying these questions and they, they were trying to figure out how some organisms thrive in these inhospitable habitats, right? So temperatures that are much higher than than they should be. And they actually ended up discovering an, an organism that's called Thermos Aquaticus. And this organism, the only reason why I'm telling you the name, is because it's one of the most important microorganisms that has ever been discovered in the planet. Because what this guy does is that it uses an enzyme, a special enzyme called polymerase, to replicate its own DNA under these very, very hot conditions. And at the time, there was, the molecular biology field was coming up and they were trying to come up with a method that they could use to make photocopies of DNA. So they were trying to replicate DNA. And they were having a really difficult time finding enzymes that actually could be used for this process. And the people who were developing that technology actually 
found this discovery of uh, thermos aquaticus and they started using that polymerase, it's known as that polymerase, to replicate DNA and this is now in 1989. So now we're, you know, 30, fully 30 years after the first observations were made. But this discovery allowed for this PCR reaction, the polymer chain reaction, reaction to actually be not only developed but also became universal in, in, in all sorts of different applications and transformed society in absolutely fundamental ways. So this is the way that we do medicine, this is the way we do criminal justice system, this is how we do uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of, of uh, agricultural uh, uh, experiment. All sorts of different things have to do with uh, using this technology that basically came out of somebody who just was curious about why were there green things growing in this whole pool where they shouldn't be. And he never set out yeah. to change the world. Well, it doesn't right? even seem like he's the one who came up with the, no, with the PCR. No, he, he wasn't the one. Right. He, he was down here. He was doing his thing. But what he did was basically transform society to the tune that this single application wow. has been estimated to impact about a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars in economic benefits is that huge. So it was is is not an incremental little step like like translational science would be, where you make progress, but each step is a tiny little step, right? When you are able to do this, then you actually you, you make these things that really just change yeah, the world. It's made like a whole right? new field of science completely available. And and not only that, this is one tiny part of it because. The exact same thing, right? So how do some organisms thrive in inhospitable habitats? Same question. Led to the discovery of extremophiles, which is this idea that we use to describe microorganisms that thrive in all sorts of environments where they actually shouldn't be. So we know that they thrive at extreme pressure, extreme temperature, extreme salinity, extreme conditions of dehydration, etc. And that those observations were all done after growth showed that these things were growing in these pools. And there are two that I'm going to put in this translational science area. This is the discovery that there are radiophiles and uh, diesel digesting bacteria. So what's a radiophile? Can you so the radiophiles are actually bacteria that can grow on um, radioactive oh materials. My God. Wow. And so these guys actually have absolutely no problem uh, living and thriving and reproducing in these conditions. Wow. And so you can imagine that the potential yeah. applications of having these microorganisms, for example, to dispose of nuclear waste is absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. The diesel digesting bacteria, they were found living in forgotten diesel drops out in Antarctica. And these guys are thriving in there. And imagine the impact of that, for example, for biodigesting yeah. this, uh, spills, you know, all these oil spills that we have everywhere that are destroying the environment. So we are right here with those right now. We know that they have an amazing impact to change the way we do things. We are not in this area yet. So we don't have an application yet. But when we do, it's going to be huge. And it's again, it's going to be yeah. a transformation yeah. thing. So that's amazing. Yeah, that's a really incredible uh, thing there. And it's amazing too. It seems like it's a network not only within the research, but among researchers as well. So it seems like it's really important for researchers to be able to communicate with each other, you know, uh, even between groups. I mean, who would have known that some algae would help molecular biologists later on down the road? That's incredible. Exactly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it out to the audience and we're going to take a quick question break. And so we'll let the audience ask a couple questions. If you guys have any questions for Patty about science, yep. Uh, radio files, so they digest the sludge. What do they transform it into? That I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so did everybody hear that? Yes. As the, the question was, what did they transform the nuclear waste into? And actually, I don't know. Okay, I have another question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed around here there are birds that migrate. I don't know if you know this either. Of course, but yeah. But they're like, uh, what are they, Canada geese? Yes. Okay. And they seem to not go anywhere. They, they migrate in the winter back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so uh, she was asking me about bird migration and why they seem to sometimes not go anywhere. Like you predict that they should always be going north or they should always be going south. <laughs> so actually the, the, the daily patterns of migration can be quite different from the seasonal patterns of migration. 
and they're totally dependent on weather conditions, local weather conditions. So they might turn around and head back to where they were the day before if there is a, a, a wind current that's coming that's contrary to what would be preferable for them to fly. They're not going to fly against the wind if it is really, really difficult for them because they spend too much energy. So sometimes even do that, even though it might look like they're not going anywhere, they're actually going to when they're supposed to be going. They'll get there. So they're smarter than you think there. The next question I have is about wind farms. Somebody else just All right. have birds. I worry about their going into wind farms. Yes, yeah, definitely. And, and there is a lot of research going on on how to help birds avoid running into um, wind farms. And one of them is actually painting things on the ground around the wind towers because birds are very visual and they're looking down when they're migrating. So they're not looking up, they're not going to see the tower, but if they're looking down and you paint warning that signs, you might make them start looking around so they'll see the tower before they see. So that seems like a really good example of, of more of this basic research where we need to know the natural history exactly. patterns of those birds in order to do that. So we got one more question yeah. down here. So, like, did the guy that you're talking about, um, was he able to prove how they thrive? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he said, like, because he, he was wondering how, did he prove how? Yes, and so uh, the question is, did the guy who was doing this work, did he prove how they thrive in these inhospitable habitats? Yeah, it's because of those enzymes that yeah, they have. But was another person the one who did the enzymes? Or? No, no, that was all part of his, that, was, that first part was, was part of his group. So he had a, a number of graduate students who were working in these questions. And so that they discovered the enzyme. But it took them a long time, right? It doesn't, it's not something that you're gonna do in a matter of a couple of years. It takes it takes a, a decade before you can actually get an answer. So like let's, uh, let's let my advisor know that it takes a decade. <laughs> <laughs> really good research. <laughs> if Beth is out there tonight, it takes a decade. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna move on a little bit, but we'll get some more questions later on. So the next question is, um, so I'm gonna play devil's advocate here, because that's what I'm good at. Um, so the question would be, if so little of this basic research actually leads to this tip of the pyramid. Is there a way that we could target that basic research? Why do we have to continue to fund this tremendous pyramid of weird, you know, it's interesting to read about in the New York Times, but doesn't really do anything, you know, is, it, is can we maybe streamline that funding and get that pyramid down a little bit? So the, the answer is partially yes, in the sense that we can, we can target projects that we do to be projects that are considered to really move science forward, okay. right? And so it's not like I come up with some science project and, and I go and I say, oh, give me money, I have an idea for a science project. That, that doesn't work? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> and so I have to actually prove my case to a bunch of other scientists to get any money. So that's, that's the step where you, can, where you can basically make sure that what you're funding is only the best stuff, is by, by making sure that scientists are justifying that the science that they're doing is likely to have a significant impact in their field. And right? so that's the peer review, where we as peers evaluate exactly. other people. That's exactly right. And so other scientists are evaluating your work and send the grant to the NIH or the National Science Foundation. Other people are saying, okay, this is good, this is gonna really make progress. But no, in, and, the, and the other side of your question is, well, can you really, really target it? The, the answer is, well, no. At that point, when it's that early in the discovery phase, it's impossible to target it. You don't know where it's going to go. And so you have to cast a wide net. It's unpredictable, right? But it's not much more so than when you think about uh, you know, the, the, the projects that get funded by investors. They, they, they cast a white net, right? And they're like, oh, we're gonna give a little bit of money to this and a little money to that, da, da, da. And most of the things they give money to don't pan out. But then when they pan out, it's like, whoa, look at this, you know, we made millions so of dollars. We're talking about the difference between like the clapper and the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> well, very valid, one maybe a little better than the other. That's right, that's right. And so, but yeah, but it, you can really, you can really target it. So you have to, you have to allow for this open, basic scientific questions to actually so we're looking for things that have, that are scientifically valid, have good scientific criteria, that have been evaluated by peers, by other scientists, but not necessarily things that we can put money on, that we can put a value on and say, this is going to bring in America a million dollars. You know, it's, 
it doesn't work that way. We have to be a little more experimental and more like investment bankers. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And so um, the next question, I guess. So here we go. Oh, yeah. So, um, and so what I was going to say about that is that we're basically the funding basic science. And so because people um, uh, really do not seem to understand the value of funding basic science, that there is that connection between basic science and applied science. And everybody's always asking, well, what good is your project, right? What good is it studying? How does it uh, help me? You know, mating behavior. Well, how is that going to help humans? Uh, you know, fly mating behavior. And how is that going to help humans? How is that going to cure cancer? How is that going to really very directly do something for humankind? And, and the answer is, you know, because we can say, well, it's going to do it in this way because we don't have such answers that it, that's the wrong question to ask, right? Um, we're actually really uh, defunding basic science. So we slowly, we have been putting holes in our little pyramid over the last decade. And the scientific funding is actually been flat at the National Science Foundation, which is the main organization in the US that funds this kind of fundamental science. Um, it's been flat for about a decade. And so the problem is that you put enough holes into this pyramid, eventually the whole thing goes away. So it's not like you're gonna be able to end up just with the tip of that pyramid with the applied science. It's if you don't fund the basic science, everything goes wrong. So we really need to put um, some effort into that. Now beyond just the obvious, you know, kind of benefits to the economics, you know, we're going to cure cancer, we're going to make the next, you know, thing. Are there other effects that this has on the culture? I mean, how does this affect us as a culture that communicates with other communities, that communicates with other countries? You know, kind of what's our literacy? What is our ability to you know, it's very important, obviously, for scientists to be able to communicate. How do we stand in the world? How can we communicate with the world scientifically if we keep defunding all of this kind of stuff? Well, so, so exactly. So that's that's a big problem, is that, um, uh, you know, we're not investing enough in science, but one of the huge benefits of science is that we're supposed to do outreach. And so a big part of getting a grant funded is the kind of what we call the broader impacts, the impacts that we have in the community. And but we're not things. here just because of broader impacts. We actually love <laughs> each and every one of you. So don't worry about right. that. But it's basically how do you how do you reach to your community and how do you tell people, look, what we're doing is important. And yep. These are some of the reasons why we do it, and this is why we should get funded, right? Uh, and and part of that is education, and it is involving graduate students, and is going to high schools and elementary schools and talking to kids about science. All of those things are are part of that outreach. And it is absolutely crucial that we do that. Um, I actually put up this graph, and I'm sorry, I know that you guys probably can't see this because it's pretty small, but this is actually a statistic from um, the National Center for uh, Science Education. And this is showing um, the relationship between the gross domestic product per capita in the world compared to the percent of the public that believes in evolution. And you can see that this is a pretty tight relationship for pretty much every country in the world except the USA. So we are down here. So so we have... We so have, we don't want to be down there as much as no. this isn't good, this is not... This is, yeah. this is, this is not good, right? And so, so this basically is saying, okay, so we, on average, if we're making about $45,000 per, per person here, most people, so 75%, should be agreeing with the statement that human beings evolved as a result of So we should be up around, you point out where the United be, Kingdom is, which is great. So this is the United yeah. Kingdom, this is Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, Netherlands. Here's Turkey, here is Cyprus. So we are just a little bit above, above Turkey on uh, how many people actually do. Statistic, and, and, and that's... You know what? There's definitely, you know, that that puts us at a disadvantage when we're communicating. Oh, absolutely! With other it, it, it puts us at a huge disadvantage, and and um, wow. you know, I think that the that the answer to this is certainly that we should be funding more science, yeah. no less. Well, I agree. Right? <laughs> yeah, more yeah. spider <laughs> science in particular. <laughs> So we, we should fund more science. That's that's really what should happen. And so I I wanted to show you guys. Uh, what an actual budget is for science in the USA. And so this is from, from the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And they put together these this, uh, nice little handy graphs. This is for the year 2014, so the year we're on right now. 
So the tone of research and development, this is now government investment, is about $144 billion. Now half of that is going to the Department of Defense. So that's more applied. So this is, this is military is application, and yeah. this, is, this is not necessarily most of the science that you and I would right. be doing. So this is going to the military. Then here we have the NIH. The NIH is the National Institutes of Health. They get a very healthy uh, chunk of that. They get about a third, and they should, of course, because the National Institutes of Health is a place where they conduct all the trials for new medicines. They do all the research that's directly related to human health. And so, of course, they have a, a good budget, and, and so they should. Uh, here's the Department of Energy. They get about $12.7 billion. NASA gets about uh, $12 billion. Here's the NSF. So the NSF is the organization that funds everything that uh, pretty much everybody in my department, in the biology department, is doing at UMass. And you would say that's a majority of that, the bottom part of that pyramid is, a um, majority of that's gonna be exactly. in that little sliver right there. That's exactly right. Wow. Yeah. So that wow. whole pyramid, that whole base of that pyramid, yeah. Is this tank a little bit right here? Wow. Here's the and the USDA actually a little bit because they do some of our of the agricultural right. research as well that has to do with test management and things like that. Um, and so as you can see, it's really not a lot of money. This is this is uh, uh, fairly small. And if you compare, you know, with other countries, how much we're actually spending in science, I put this little graph here just to show. One of the things that I find to be rather disturbing, and I'm sorry, I'm going to read out some of these numbers just because I think they're interesting. This is expenditure in science as a percentage of the GDP, and this is in year 2009, 2010, and 2011. Here's China. So China has gone from 1.7% to 1.76% to 1.84%. To two percent. That's a continual increase. So Ch yeah. China is increasing every single year their investment in science. Uh, most of the countries are, are fairly flat, you know, with some minor oscillations, a little bit of increase. For example, in the Czech Republic, the Netherlands are increasing. Belgium is staying about the same. France is staying about the same. Here is the United States. We've gone from 291 in 2009, 283. <laughs> 277, 2.61 this last year. And so we should remember too, a lot of these countries, you know, especially the European countries, are undergoing some huge economic pressures Pressure, as well, exactly. not just as us, but they're still kind of keeping the... They're keeping yeah. their investment in science high because yeah. they recognize that that's where they're going to get most value for their money. Uh, and then notice also that the United States is not the country that's investing the most in science in terms of their GDP. So there is Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Israel. Every one of those countries invests more money of their uh, GDP in science than we do. Well, more per higher percentage, I yeah. should say. And I wanted to show you this here because um, these, are, these are actually figures from 2010. The United States has spent $400 billion, $400 billion in research and development, but almost 70% of that is actually coming from private business investors. Oh, wow. So the government is funding only a tiny portion of this seemingly large number. Whereas in China, $295 billion, 85% of that comes from the government, and 15% comes from private investment. So what that means is actually how much of that science is going to directly benefit the public that's not tied to private interests, the percentages are totally flipped. So in the United States, most of our science budget, most of the innovation is going on in the private sector rather than being financed by the government. So while that has some advantages, I think that we could do a lot better so by increasing could, government investments. Because you could argue that you know this type of science that's funded through NSF, through those types of things, are what we might call more creative, more risky, exactly. maybe that kind of science, like, hey, what's that weird slime that's growing in that pool, exactly. you know, where it'd be really hard to maybe sell that to a private company, um, or say, why spider brains are so amazing, that would be really hard to maybe sell the Sears Roebuck, yep. but, you know? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It, it, it results in different kinds of science being funded, and, uh, you know, and especially the fact that there are no so many private interests in the science, I think. Uh, and so for just for a quick comparison, 
uh, that I will tell this in here, which is the, the military budget uh, uh, that, that we have. Uh, and this is for uh, 2013, so this is uh, prior to sequestration, actually. So the United States spends uh, about 40% of the total budget in the world. So we spend more money in our military than the next 10 top countries combined. And that amounts to about $650 billion. And this has come down significantly from previous years, yeah. where it was almost, if, if we got to the point that it was almost $800 billion when we were fighting two wars um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is now, with all that decrease, we have, uh, we invest an, an insane amount of money in the military um, when compared to other countries. So I, I think, you know, one of the questions that we have to ask then is, um, you know, with this massive shift in budget, and I know that I've felt it myself, that there is a massive shift to, um, you know, you have to really almost do, it's a joke where you have to do 95% of your work before you submit to NSF to get the other 5% funded, um, because they're just not willing to do exploratory science. They're just not willing to do science, and, and it's understandable. They have a tiny, tiny, tiny budget. Um, you know, what are the consequences to science? What are the consequences to us as a country, to our innovation, to our ability to be innovators? You know, how does this change the face of science? And what are some of the, you know, the consequences to us as a scientific community? Yeah, so the, the biggest consequences is what you just mentioned, which is uh, the, the real innovation at this stage. And that to NSF is a priority. They're very, very worried that as their budget gets smaller, they're funding safer and safer projects at a time rather than ideas that are really going to be these transformational um, ideas. And you know, they, they're, they're trying, they're trying to make an effort to, to put those projects in there, but it's really difficult to justify when you just don't have that data. So there are some grants, some small exploratory grants that you can apply for, but they're very reduced in scope. And in reality, what's happening is that we are not able to really break completely new ground because our hands are pretty tight. We need to have a lot of background information before we can do so before we move on to the next section, we're going to break and, and open it up to questions. I know we just like brought the room down terribly, so <laughs> you know. Ah, so let's uh, let's see. Well, let's see if anybody else has any questions. Let's yeah. Go ahead. what it is. I think that, um, uh, you know, religion might play a part of it, but I can tell you, I was brought up a Catholic, all my family are Catholics, and they all believe in evolution. Yeah, the Pope you. already <laughs> said, you know, yeah. maybe, but, but they can't possibly be that many fundamentalists, you know. I don't it know. is interesting, you know, and in some of it I know, like in Texas, you know, you have kind of a very, very, uh, you know, non-liberal, uh, very conservative group, and something like Texas, what a lot of people don't know, is that so goes Texas, so goes the rest of the nation. So Texas is one of the largest uh, buyers of textbooks in the country, and so when Texas decrees something like we want to have intelligent design, the textbook companies make their textbooks to fit that particular group. And so then that goes out and becomes a textbook for everyone, and there's a great documentary called The Revisionist, which is a great thing to see, but I, I think as, some, as an evolutionary biologist, I think a lot of it is just basic misunderstanding. And some of that comes from you know, the media, if things are not being presented uh, fairly or correctly. And in us there's versus them. I, I don't think there needs to be an us versus them. There are plenty of Christian scientists who do great evolutionary work. And I, I, I hate that there's a barrier there. It doesn't seem necessary. Yeah? Um, uh, I, I think that a, um, a going back um, a big problem uh, that we um, uh, still are seeing is that they're they're not um, like the open source of uh, uh, edible or anyone textbooks that they're they're created by by a um, uh, uh, corporation um, uh, that that's message is not in um, uh, well, I'm not that I'm not educating for its um, uh, making profit um, even though educating. Might be a, be, be one, one objective 
um, I admit they can probably a uh, public company that um, they have to use uh, this uh, investors. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, we wish that our, our um, uh, elementary schools and high schools should see a much um, greater use of uh, open source uh, textbooks and um, uh, and um, uh, open source um, uh, uh, learning resources um, uh, because they, they, they can be um, uh, validated by anyone. Certainly, I, I think I think yeah. that at UMass, for example, yeah. there is a huge movement right now trying to do that because yeah. of the cost of textbooks, and, and hopefully that will translate yeah. down to high schools. And we do have open source journaling and things like that. Oh, sorry, no. That, so, so the comment was basically that textbooks. Uh, part of the problem is that textbooks are, are designed for uh, profit, not really to educate people, but it's how do we sell more of them and how do we make more money. Though I will say that there's a lot of really good publishers that do have scientists on staff, and so there are a lot of scientists on staff at these places. And of course, open to the public always makes it dangerous because you don't have credentialing, you don't have people you know, who actually kind of know what they're saying. I can tell you how many evolutionary things on Wikipedia I've found. Um, but, you know, I think that there is there is in science a culture of peer review and a culture of, of peer communication, and I think that is really important. Um, so, I mean, the good thing about Wikipedia is that it's a source, you can't rely on it, but there are increasingly sources that it is. It's true. So there are a lot of benefits to an open source. So what we're going to do, um, we actually do want to move on to the next section, and then we're going to get to some more questions. But I really, really, this is the part that I really, really want to talk about. And the reason I really want to talk about this is because this is very dear to Patty. And um, this is, is a story that inspired me as someone who does do research that people say, well, how does that benefit me? And I go, <laughs> well, it doesn't. Um, but, uh, but sorry. Uh, but what I really like, I would really like to know, so you did not start out as someone who's just like, I'm going to become an advocate for science. I'm going to get out there. You started out as a research scientist just like me. Um, and so you have a really interesting story, and I think it's a story that has happened to a lot of people now in this really hyper media environment. And I'd really love to hear your story. This is the part where we're going to be talking about some some organs. Yeah, genitalia. Genitalia, which are awesome, by the way. Um, so Patty, tell us your story. Tell us how you, how you got into this. All right. So um, I cover your eyes, everybody. Know. No, no, no. You're, no, no. Absolutely not. Um, so I, um, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I've been studying uh, uh, genitalia in, for, for a while, for several years. And uh, specifically, I've been looking at ducks, because ducks are really fascinating. Most of you may not know that birds actually do not have any genitalia at all. Um, and the, there are a few species that actually do still have penises, and ducks are one of them. And uh, their penises are very intricate, very weird. And they actually have a, a, a very violent mating system where the male and the female will form a pair bond. And you will see them this time of the year. You see the pairs of dogs everywhere. But a lot of male dogs are left unpaired. And those guys that are left unpaired have only one strategy if they want to get any kind of reproductive success. And that is that they will try to force females to copulate with them. And females can't get away from those males because the males are pretty pretty strong and sometimes there are several males. So what females have done is they've actually have evolved very convoluted vaginas in turn. And in these ducks, the males and the females are engaged in an, in an evolutionary arms race, literally a reproductive battle that's being played out in their genitalia. And it is a really fascinating story. Uh, I started doing this when I was a postdoc and for years, I got lots and lots of positive press. So I was out in the, uh, in the New York Times, uh, in Ducks, War of the Sexes, Place Out of the Evolution of Genitalia. It was out in, uh, in the, the Loom and the National Geographic. Uh, 
uh, talking about the battle sexes of the dogs. So he was in The Guardian, he was in The Economist. And so for years, uh, people have, were reporting on, on my research as something that was really evolutionarily fascinating, right? So these dogs are really doing something very strange, um, and, uh, and it, just, it just was an interesting question. However, uh, last year, uh, I was sitting, I have, I have set up a Google alert, you know, so that I get little uh, emails. I can only somebody, imagine the stuff you get in your Google alert. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, but it's, it's basically when somebody's discussing my research online or something gets posted online, I get an email saying, Ping, you know, somebody's talking about dog and, uh, and you'd be surprised how many people do that. I'm actually not surprised. <laughs> I wish I was. I, I wish I was. But last year, uh, my, my Google alert flashed a message saying that the Christian News Services had posted a story stating that I had gotten a federal grant uh, to look at plasticity in dog penis line. And I went, oh, okay, well, that's interesting, <laughs> I guess. And within a few hours, in a matter of hours, this very factual story just started spreading everywhere, and it became really, really nasty. So here. Uh, here's uh, another one of the, of the headlines. Feds found vital study on snail sex and dog penises. Cleveland Air Show and White House <laughs> tours is still canceled. So those are directly parts. related. So they are directly related. Yeah, obviously, so every duck penis you look at, yeah, no. they act one tour of the White House. One to one. And, and so, um, uh, you know, this this was now all happening during the sequestration. So this is when all the budget discussion, what's going on about the sequestration. Um, this is PolitiFact. Is the federal government funding a study on dog penises? Mostly true. Yeah. Because yeah. It's yeah. Amber Lee acts. Ouch. Yet even in this budget climate, your federal government still has the money to pay for, please disregard our blushing, a study examining dog penises. So as you can imagine, this is a scientist's worst nightmare. I wanted to hide under my desk and never come out again. I was like, oh no, you know, this is terrible. Worst thing ever happened to me. Um, oh no, and, and it got worse. So th that was bad, but it got worse. Because then it ended up in Fox News, where they actually did a poll asking the readers whether Don Pino's study was a proper use of taxpayer money, to which 86% of Fox News readers said no, it wasn't. Um, and this is interesting because Fox News was actually one of the sites that had published positively on my research when Bush was president. So, you know? <laughs> anyway, I won't say more on that, except that, you know, I was, I was getting pretty impressed. This was really terrible. We're glad you're still with us. Brady. I know, but that is because I have friends, right? And so lots of science reporters have uh, reported on my science positively over the years. And they jumped up in my defense. And so Carl Zimmer uh, wrote a wonderful piece, Dogs Meet the Culture World's Worst, basically saying, this is all news, and it's awesome evolutionary research, and these people shouldn't be talking about it. It was out in the, the, the Daily Beast. Uh, yes, we should study dog penises. And I'm like, yes, we should. <laughs> Uh, the latest conservative outrage is about dog penises. Um, and then uh, this one actually I love because they coined, they coined the term dog penis gate. <laughs> That's what all the scientists look for. We all want something named after us. I know. I can't, You've got dog penis gate. That's wonderful. I can't make this stuff up. And that was, that was the hashtag of the Twitter feed that had thousands of tweets talking about this. Um, and then, and then, of course, uh, this is this is another one from Mother Jones. Why the GOP should love the penises? And that is because because uh, they actually do. The females can't shut that whole thing down. If you of course remember, it's right, right. That's right. That's so he wasn't so crazy. Yeah, that's is actually true. He was just talking about ducks. That's right. Uh, and so, you know, it was wonderful. This, this is uh, from another website. Everything about the penis is interesting. And so, you know, people were defending this work that I've been doing for a while. And so that was wonderful. And I, I felt like, okay, you know, I can breathe again. And it's so nice that they're coming in my defense. But I still felt like I needed to do something. Yeah. And they were talking about my science and my work. And it was clearly being used for political maneuvering. And that was the part that I wasn't very happy with. 
I was, I was absolutely happy to be questioned, and people should ask, yeah, why are you getting money to study without penises? And I can answer that question. I will talk anybody's ears off about that. <laughs> but that was not what was happening. What was happening is they were using these for political purposes, and that was not okay. So I needed to do something, but what should I do? And most people were like, oh, don't do anything. These people are crazy. It'll blow over. It'll blow over. Don't do anything. Because this happens all the time. Do you guys remember the shrink? It was in the news and TV everywhere. This little shrimp running on a treadmill, you know? And, and they made such fun of this poor little shrimp, even though that was a tiny fraction of the total grant that this person had gotten. And he was. The, the, the shrimp and the treadmill were almost irrelevant to the broader question of what the, he was being asked. It just sounded silly, it just sounded funny, and they wanted to find some kind of scientific project to mock. And so that, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. And I think that this is why people don't believe in science. Because they think that science is something silly and is something funny that you can laugh at. Because that's what happens in Capitol Hill all the time. So should I respond to the negative comments? Well, that, that was really hard. That would have been really hard. Or write letters to the misleading websites. You know, who would read those letters and, and do what? So the other alternative was, well, maybe I should write my own response. And that's what I ended up doing. And so I wrote a, a response that was published in Slate, Why I Studied Dog Genitalia. And, and what I basically wanted to, to um, say in this piece, and what I said in this piece, was basically that, first of all, my study had been funded during the Bush administration first. That it had nothing to do with politics, as all science should. Because science should never be meddled with politics. Science and scientific decisions are made by other scientists, not by people in government, because that's not their expertise. So I got money during the Bush administration, thank you very much. And so this has nothing to do with Obama or sequestration or anything. Then I wanted to make the point that my research was basic research. So my research is at that base of that pyramid. And the reason why I got money is because this is a fundamental evolutionary question that nobody else has studied before and is weird. It is so weird that we need to find out why is it happening and how is it happening? And that's what they gave me the money so that I could go ahead and do that. Now the next thing is it may or it may not end up being an application. I don't know. Maybe by the time my kids are grown up, you know, this somebody will be telling the story of how this crazy woman went out to look for the penises and found, you know, some amazing thing. I don't know. Nobody does, but that's the whole point. But in the meantime, it's absolutely a fascinating thing that deserves to be studied and that we should be looking into. And then finally, another point was the point about how is science, how are science funds allocated in the country? So I'll tell you something that I learned which I thought was very interesting. The National Science Foundation is the, is the institute that allocates research funds to all scientists who are doing this kind of research in the USA. They come up with a budget and they give it to the president, but the NSF works for the president of the United States. And the president looks at the NSF budget and they say, uh, no, sorry, this is not what you're going to ask for. This is actually what you're going to ask for. And so they get to have a budget that's decided on by the president's office. And then the president's office submits that budget, and that gets voted on in Congress, which is what's happening right now as we speak. The NSF cannot even ask for the money they need themselves. They don't even have that power. So we are the people who have that power. We are the ones who can ask it's your Congress money, it or not. to give more money to science. We are the ones with the power. I was sitting in my office, happy to be doing my research, and I would have never gotten involved in this. But now that I have seen how important it is, this is the call for action. I think that we all, as good citizens of this country, we have to think about what is the vision for our country that we want. Do we want more money into science? so that we can build a better world for, world for everybody? Or do we want more money going into the military when we already spend more than everybody else is ever going to spend? We could easily double our research budget. We could easily do it if there was a the political will to do so. And that is never going to happen unless the, science, the citizens, and of course the scientists, ask for it in capital. And so that's, that, that's my process. That was my personal journey. 
And that's part of the reason why I'm here, because I want to make sure that you guys know what the situation really is and why these things are important and why we should really fight for what's right and get more money for science. So that's great. And, and we really appreciate you being here. I, I know that this is you're doing this in addition to doing your research, which you're still doing, and in addition to everything else. And so you know, we really appreciate you taking your time. We're running a little short on time, so we're just going to limit it to a couple questions. I know you had a question well, in the back. About the, the private sector, does that mean that um, patents and research go directly um, to whoever privately funded it? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you if you are working for a biotech company and you discover some gene that has a specific function for something that you want, you can go on and patent that gene as patented to the business. So then it becomes unavailable to the general public for a very, 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 very long time. Which you can see the ramifications for that. You know, if I discover something that can cure cancer and I work for a company, I can actually patent that and you know make money off that and limit it to other people and that's been a huge fight there's been a huge fight talking about can you patent the human genome you know can you patent our genes and and so that's something we have to really work towards uh, is, is trying to pull apart money and science which is really tricky yeah. um, so you were talking about um, the US and the EU and the USA puts so much money into a military and so not enough money into science mm -hmm. and I agree with you because when you look at the chart it's crazy that the USA even has that much money to spend 40% of the world's money yeah. and yeah. it's insane that they would spend that money on Military. You should run for, should run for an office. That's yeah, right. yeah. This kid, run for Congress. Yeah, definitely. That's where I'm at. So there we go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. It's absolutely so, true. 